We've all seen them. From movies to TV shows to video games, zombies permeate popular culture like no other. But what is a zombie? Wikipedia defines a zombie as a mythological undead corporeal revenant created through the reanimation of a corpse. You may think zombies solely exist in the realm of fiction and imagination, but you're actually quite wrong. There's a quiet movement going on behind the scenes right now, a movement to create a real zombie. The process starts immediately after death. A special ops team is called in and they get to work in seconds. The blood is immediately pumped full with a cocktail of chemicals while the corpse is cooled close to the freezing point of water and flown through their mysterious facility in Arizona. There, the corpse's chest is forcibly pried open and prepped before the final stage of zombification. Some say this is only for the rich. Others say it's entirely a scam, a disgusting pyramid scheme designed to prey on our most primal insecurities, fear of death because no one really knows what comes next when we die. Many religions capitalize on this, creating a complex system designed to both comfort its followers and inspire obedience to its rules. This particular movement also preys on the vulnerable, offering false hope of coming back from the dead while masking other more potentially obvious motives. It's easy to do this when your target audience is the layperson and you hide behind a thick veil of complex medical jargon and fancy procedures that sound good but are ultimately useless and unproven. Well, have no fear. I am a doctor who completed residency training at a Harvard hospital with both a medical degree from Yale and an undergraduate degree from Harvard. I will be your guide and I will walk you through exactly what you need to know. In fact, this entire channel is dedicated to dispelling medical myths and increasing health literacy through the telling of interesting stories. If that sounds appealing to you at all, then please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Today, there are 500 people awaiting this experimental procedure and thousands more who have signed up. Who are these people and what organization is behind this utter madness? The concept of freezing the dead and bringing them back to life was first scientifically proposed by Michigan professor Robert Edinger when he wrote The Prospect of Immortality in the 1960s. Just four years later, the first human body would be frozen as a test, but she was soon thawed out and buried by angry relatives. The largest operation at the time was run out of a cemetery by Robert Nelson, but quite frankly, he sucked at it. Every dead body he's put into his vaults have been simply left to rot, sometimes frozen to the sides of the metal canister like a human popsicle, while others decomposed into a pile of sludge that technicians later had to thaw and scrape out of there like rotten lasagna. While the industry likes to tout the fact that it has come a long way from this gruesome beginning, it really hasn't made much progress fundamentally. To show you how laughable all of this is, let's walk you through the process from start to finish. It all starts with the feeling. One day, when you're feeling more existential than usual and contemplating your end, be it toe cancer, a brain melting virus, or choking on a hot dog, you happen to stumble upon the homepage of Alcor. You scroll through and immediately get inspired by the low resolution beach scene, the mannequin covered in plastic fake ice cubes, and the likely staged surgical stock photo until you see it. That beautiful, most exquisite thing you never even knew was possible. You only have two thoughts in your head at this point. One, where has this oversized thermos been all your life? And two, you love to stuff your dead body inside that thing one day. Composing yourself, you continue, pausing only on the four rich white people on the front page, and you realize some very, very strange things. Specifically, that you have nothing in common with any of them. You have no idea who any of these people are, and most importantly, you have no idea what a futurist is, or where to go and apply and claim this title for yourself officially. Does it appear on your driver's license? But despite all of this, you are mysteriously compelled to want to pay up to $900 a month to be part of their club, giving you the privilege to then pay another $200,000 in the near future, plus all of these other surcharges, so that when you actually do die, your body can be shipped to their facility for the horrific pseudoscientific experimentation I'm about to talk about, all to make you into their next zombie. And what if you don't have that much money? Don't worry, just name Alcor as the primary beneficiary of your life insurance policy, something they actively promote. Forget the fact that the purpose of life insurance is to help your family and loved ones you leave behind. After all, it's more important to preserve your rotting corpse and become a zombie than it is to provide for your family. I mean, duh, everyone knows that. The process of becoming a zombie, according to Alcor, goes something like this. 
Though we do not have the technology to fix your broken body now, we most definitely will in the future. Thus, if we can preserve your current state by freezing you, we can buy you enough time to an age when we've cured every possible disease with nanotechnology. And then when that happens, we'll thaw and bring you back. Because in the future, anything is possible. Yay! In fact, we'll even add in some special laser shooting eyes and make your big guy even bigger. You see, when promises only have to be kept by someone else living in some distant future fantasy land, you can pretty much promise anything you want. It's actually an ingenious business model. All the heavy lifting is done by someone else, while all you have to do is collect a fat paycheck. Oh yeah, and freeze a dead body. But at least we can trust them to do that, right? Why don't we ask them? Can we trust you to do this? Not at all. Once you've given us your money and die, we don't really care about you anymore. We may even accidentally drill a few extra holes into your brain. We've done it before. Just ask our most famous client, baseball hall of famer, Ted Williams. We decapitated his head, shaved it, drilled it with holes, and cracked it with a monkey wrench. While trying to knock off a tuna can, we accidentally froze to his scalp. I'm not even making that stuff up. Look it up. If we can get away with it with him, who knows what we'll do with you. But guess what? You won't care either. You know why? Because you'll be dead. That's the best part. Ha ha ha. Okay, but at the very least, the process to freeze me and preserve my brain should be straightforward and simple, right? I mean, the science behind it all checks out, right? Yeah, let me be honest with you. Before I started research on this thing, I had an open mind. The deeper I looked and the more papers I read, the more ludicrous I realized this entire enterprise is. To illustrate this, I'll use this horizontal bar underneath me to represent the likelihood of proper preservation. We'll simply call it the likelihood of you still being you. Most people aren't even close to 100% right before the time of death, even when they're still alive. Not only are their bodies riddled with diseases and other age-related wear and tear, their minds are a barren wasteland of shrunken brain cells and irreversible dementias. Thus, we'll start at 85%. You're currently in the hospital dying. Who are you supposed to call? Your friends, your family, and your dog, right? They make it just in time and they're all there, huddled around your hospital bed talking about good times gone by. In your barely lucid state, you muster the energy and sit up for one final goodbye, tearfully telling them how much you love them and how much you'll miss them. Oh wait, who, who's that guy? Oh yeah, you had to call Alcor, remember? The organization who wants to harvest your body, cram you into a tin can, and drill holes into your head? Yeah, in order to best preserve your brain, they have to be there and act within seconds of your death. Because once your heart stops, you have basically six minutes before your brain cells irreversibly die. In a laughable scientific research paper published trying to justify Alcor's existence, the author Ben Best cites a hodgepodge of studies on dogs, cats, and rats to argue that it is possible to extend this six minute window by giving patients a witch's brew of random medical drugs. Yeah, I'm sorry Ben, who are you again? Oh, I see. It's just a very minor conflict of interest. And you're not even a doctor. As an ER doctor who specializes in resuscitation of patients in cardiac arrest, I can assure you that blindly giving this witch's brew does not work in real life. But if we are to assume you've paid Alcor enough for them to be at your bedside the moment your heart stops, what is this magic thing they'll start doing to preserve your brain? Wait a second, isn't that just CPR? But your website proudly and confidently declares that step one of the whole shebang is to restore circulation. Like full stop, no modifiers, fully restore circulation back to 100%. Because even though you've cutely named your fancy procedure CPS for cardiopulmonary support to differentiate this from CPR, you're still just banging on the dead dude's chest, literally the exact same thing the doctor was doing right when the patient died. That's not sleazy or misleading marketing at all. But ignoring that for the moment, just how effective is CPR anyway? I'll answer that for you, real bad. The American Heart Association studied this and found that CPR provides only 10 to 30% of normal flow to the heart and 30 to 40% of blood flow to the brain. In fact, CPR has such a bad survival rate that according to one Johns Hopkins study, 90% of doctors surveyed would not even want CPR at the end of their life. 
The lay public may not realize it, but CPR is not the life-saving procedure everyone wants it to be. It is good at a few things though, like completely cracking apart your rib cage and smashing your lungs into mashed potatoes. To offer even more perspective, a cardiac arrest with CPR ongoing for more than 25 minutes comes with it a very grave prognosis. It's so bad that most of the time, when I'm in the ER actively trying to resuscitate the patient, I'm almost hoping the guy's heart does not restart, because with such prolonged CPR times, these people end up completely brain dead, requiring feeding tubes and ventilators and an army of caretakers to survive. And that's just 25 minutes of CPR. How long is Alcor planning on doing CPR before they officially preserve you? 48 hours. Yeah, your brain is going to be straight up literal mush at this point. Unless you live in Arizona and your next door neighbor is literally this Alcor facility, you're going to need to factor in 48 hours of transport time. The logistics of transporting a dead body via airplane is a tad tricky to say the least. So, 48 hours of half-assed blood flow to the brain through repetitive CPR punches to the chest. That's the miracle Alcor is bringing to the table for you. You know, the thing you just paid a quarter million dollars for. You sure you want to do this? Are you sure future zombie you even wants this brain anymore when it looks like this? The only other thing that potentially mitigates this huge brain is dying every second that passes problem is cooling the brain to near freezing temperatures to slow down metabolism. But practically speaking, no one's bringing your body from 37 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees within the 6 minute time window just by throwing a few ice cubes around your body. But again, assuming you are able to overcome the laws of physics and achieve this, you run into all sorts of logistical problems next. Your corpse, now in a body bag, surrounded with ice cubes, is about to board a plane. Someone has to ensure that, one, your entire corpse never thaws and refreezes because doing so will cause a lot of damage, and two, your temperature doesn't actually reach zero degrees Celsius. Reaching zero degrees means the water in your brain cells will freeze, expand, and rip apart your brain completely. Is anyone going to officially monitor all this when your body's stored in the cargo hold of a plane? Because nobody's bringing a dead corpse as a carry-on, that's for sure. Sir, your dead body can't be in the emergency exit aisle. Please store him in the overhead bin above you. Once again, let's sweep these problems under the rug too, because we have a third problem to tackle. Massive internal bleeding. At some point in this process, Alcor will begin pumping your blood with all sorts of things. Antibiotics, vitamins, acid buffers, and streptokinase, a clot busting drug made from strep bacteria. A dangerous, somewhat outdated drug that's not even commonly used in the living because it can cause severe life-threatening anaphylactic reactions and massive bleeding in your brain. When doctors consider using this class of drugs, they meticulously go through an entire checklist of precautions and contraindications line by line to ensure safety. While you got Alcor over here literally giving it to everyone like it's candy. Do you know why? because it's a great marketing tool. Let's dissolve all the clots in the heart and brain and ensure great blood flow and circulation. Looks great on a pamphlet, but in actuality, all it's doing is causing hemorrhage to all your major organs. But again, you're already dead and Alcor is about to freeze you into a popsicle and hide away your damaged corpse forever. How convenient. So, now that you've finally arrived at their home facility, the final preservation process can occur. Someone will now saw open your sternum and connect your heart and aorta to a machine. Your blood will be sucked out of your body while a chemical mixture is pumped in, turning your organs into glass in a process called vitrification, mimicking the way a mosquito is preserved in amber. Of course, the chemical solution used is extremely toxic to cells, which isn't surprising considering one ingredient used in this chemical slurry is ethylene glycol, or antifreeze. You know, the stuff you put in cars but will kill you if you drink it. After poisoning your body, your corpse is now dipped into a vat of liquid nitrogen like a tea bag, causing the different parts of your body to rapidly cool to negative 196 degrees Celsius at varying rates. As a result, huge cracks begin to form from thermomechanical stress as your tissues expand and contract completely out of sync with one another. This isn't just theoretical. In 1983, when three frozen bodies were thawed, large cracks were found everywhere and I mean everywhere, including in all major organs. The spinal cord was snapped into three pieces while the heart was fractured into bits, not to mention exploded blood vessels riddling nearly every square inch. The conclusion in the report was unequivocal. The tremendous tissue deterioration will require incredibly advanced medical technology to fix, likely requiring rebuilding the body at the molecular level. What that means is that even under optimized conditions and after ignoring a bunch of quite literally impossible logistical hurdles, the theoretical likelihood of proper preservation is a mere 1%. And that's being incredibly generous. 
practically speaking, no one is going to be that invested in preserving your corpse perfectly. So accounting for human error, that 1% is probably closer to 0.00001%. So in the far distant future, if humans haven't died out from a nuclear holocaust, world ending pandemics or global warming, and Alcor remembers to pay its utility bills and not embezzle its members funds, and we've managed to figure out how to reconstruct bodies on a molecular basis, atom by atom, maybe then your dead body will finally be ready to be reanimated. Unfortunately, even then, based on our calculations, you'll have so much irreversible brain damage, you'll actually become a zombie. You know, the rotten, brain-dead, ugly-looking piece of crap version we all know and love today. And when that happens, I hope you enjoy your new life. I sincerely hope it was worth the wait. It's not coincidence most mainstream scientists and doctors look down on this practice. Needless to say, there's probably much better things to spend your money on that could actually benefit someone alive today and with 100% certainty. But I do understand aging can be a very frustrating thing. If you're curious to why we age, then check out this video next that answers that very question. And if you made it this far, please like, share, and subscribe to Spoon Fed Med. Studies show that hitting the subscribe button makes you two times more likely to become a good looking zombie. Okay, my friends, until next time, stay humble, stay healthy, stay fresh. Peace.